Welcome. I'd like to welcome everyone to the Abbott session, Treating Advanced Heart Failure Patients, Choosing the Right Device at the Right Time. Uh, thank you for taking your evening to come out uh, to dinner uh, and to this program. I think you will uh, have a real treat and get a lot of very good information. Um, we really appreciate you spending your evening with us. Uh, you know, if you started the 6.30 session this morning, it's been a long day, but us uh -huh. nurses power through, right? Um, yeah. So we're gonna try and stay on time so we can power through so you can maybe go out when the rain stops. Um, so my name is Lisa Rathman, and I am uh, the immediate past president of the American Association of Heart Failure Nurses. I'm also a heart failure nurse practitioner at uh, Lancaster General Hospital, um, part of the Penn system, thank you. Um, and I was supposed to roll off the board uh, this year, but I'm now the director of development, so um, <laughs> I remain on the board. Um, but it is, uh, as to all of you, uh, it is a um, labor of love and uh, fantastic organization. So. Um, at any rate, thank you for coming. I have uh, two co-presenters tonight, uh, Mickey Gilbert, uh, and she's at Chilton Medical Center in New Jersey. Uh, she's a nurse practitioner. I have Tasha Freitag on the end uh, from University of Minnesota. I didn't know this was a cheering con contest here. <laughs> um, um, I paid from it. University of Minnesota, and she is as well a nurse practitioner. Um, I actually didn't ask these guys for bios ahead of time. I said, guys, I think I'm just going to introduce us. We're the heart fear queens of the universe. But um, at any rate, so let's get started. So we're going to, um, you know, talk about the journey of a patient uh, choosing the right device at the right time. Full disclosure, I have to say, um, being from Lancaster, Pennsylvania, um, none of my patients look like this model. Um, but this actually, this slide was from Mickey, and apparently in New Jersey they do. So, uh, at any rate. So those are our disclosures. So heart failure in 2019. I, I don't have to stand up here and tell you guys this. You guys, you know, live, sleep, eat, eat, breathe. Um, all of these statistics. Uh, we know it's an epidemic. There's one million hospitalizations. They're not going down. Three million for um, heart failure as a contributor. There's three million office visits a year. Average length of stay is five days. And the readmission rate still is in the 20 percentile range. Um, and it, it's an expensive disease. We know those costs by 2030 are expected to rise to $70 billion. Um, for those of you who have read that AHA paper, um, can you tell me each taxpayer how much that will cost each taxpayer in the United States to care for just heart failure alone? Anybody know from that paper? $244 per taxpayer in the United States if, if we get to that $70 billion. 50% of that cost is due to hospitalizations. So obviously keeping our patients well and out of the, heart fit, out of the hospital is what we want to do because uh, cost is a major driver of, of care. So let's, talk, let's start with a case study because um, it always brings it home to nurses when we can relate it to a patient. Um, so 36-year-old Caucasian female um, and like many of our patients has pneumonia-like symptoms, weak, tired, for a couple of months. Many of our patients get treated for pneumonia, asthma, which turns out to be cardiac asthma, for a long time uh, till they finally get admitted with acute decompensated heart failure. Um, and you can see the chest x-ray, the heart size is big, a little fluffy. Um, echocardiogram reveals an EF of 30%, no wall motion abnormality, moderate MR, left ventricular diastolic diameter is 5.8 centimeters, so big. Clear coronary arteries, um, and we can see filling pressures are high, cardiac index is low at 1.7, SVR is high. Uh, cardiac MRI, no infiltrative cardiomyopathy, EF is 31%. So obviously diuresis start on medical therapy, um, but medical therapy was a challenge in that the patient had blood pressures um, that were low. And we see this often when we're starting initial therapies. Our patients don't quite tolerate medicines at first, so we have to do baby doses to get them on medicines. Um, remained intermittently hypotensive, and really the metoprolol had to get cut back to 12.5 milligrams daily. And we see that sometimes in the early follow-up period. 
uh, patients started cardiac rehab, and they were seen very, very frequently to titrate medications um, to try and help that cardiomyopathy. But fast forward three months. Three months later, the patient continues with New York Heart Association Class 3 heart failure symptoms. Uh, blood pressure is 90 over 60, heart rate 90, uvolemic on exam, labs, creatinine is fine, 0.8, and you can see our medical therapy, certainly not at target doses of guideline-directed medical therapy, very limited by blood pressure. Uh, echocardiogram, um, LV size has really not gotten better, EF 25 to 30, and moderate MR. So we've not made a whole lot of progress. Now, I know this is a busy slide, but this is from the guidelines. So, you know, we've got them on the start of medications. What potentially is the, the next therapies we can consider? Uh, well, we've done spironolactone already. We've got her on that. We've got her on ACE. We've got her on a beta blocker. Um, you know, we could consider Evabradine. Hydralazine nitrates, not so much. She doesn't have much blood pressure. She's Caucasian. Um, we haven't talked about CRT, but I haven't shown you any um, EKGs. Well, her EKG, she does have left bundle, um, and her QRS is wide, 150 milliseconds, so she would benefit from CRT. If we look at the guidelines, what's in the guidelines? Uh, patient has a cardiomyopathy um, greater than three months um, uh, or greater than 40 days after an MI. Uh, EF is less than 35, yes. She's in good state of health, so she doesn't have frailty or another medical condition that would limit her life expectancy. Um, and she is acceptable non-cardiac health as well. So if we look at the buckets of where she fits, she obviously is in the class three, uh, NYHA class three. Her EF is less than 35. QRS is greater than 150 milliseconds, or just about there. Left bundle branch block pattern and sinus rhythm. If you see, that's in the green box um, under New York Heart Association Class 3, so that's a Class 1 recommendation. Um, should absolutely do this. She benefits from this. Um, you can see the other box that would benefit from this is the Class 2 patient. Uh, the yellow boxes, you can consider it uh, maybe beneficial. Um, and obviously, uh, the red boxes obviously uh, are um, contraindicated. You shouldn't do this. You can make them worse. Uh, but in our patient's case, um, she should benefit from CRT. So what are the trials shown us with CRT? And again, this therapy has been around for quite a while. Patients feel better. Uh, hemodynamically, we see improvements. Functional status improves. Quality of life improves. Um, LV volume typically gets smaller, uh, and hopefully heart function, heart remodels, natriuretic peptides improve, um, patients are in the hospital less, and improve survival if patients are responders to CRT. But we know from the literature, and even the literature now, 30% of patients don't respond to cardiac resynchronization therapy. Uh, and if we look at purely uh, LV remodeling, which is what we want to see, 40% of patients are non-responders to cardiac resynchronization therapy. So I'm going to talk a little bit about non-responders from my perspective, the heart failure provider, on how we approach those patients, because we see them every day in our practice. Um, I will tell you I'm not uh, an EP um, provider. In my practice, um, we have a large um, heart failure clinic. We also have a large EP program. And for a while, I would fill in um, for my um, EP queens, the, the NPs on the EP side, and I'd be like, "Okay, the princess is here. I can, you know, I can, I know enough to get through the day and help the electrophysiologist, but I am not an EP queen." Um, but early patient evaluation as to response to CRT is really, really, really important. This is data from the Cleveland Clinic. Um, they looked at over 500 patients, and they prospectively followed patients with cardiac resynchronization uh, for up to 10 years. And they looked at, um, they put them in buckets uh, of uh, responder, super responder, and non-responder. And how they, how they defined response, non-responder was a 4% uh, or less improvement in ejection fraction. Responder was a 5 to 20% improvement in ejection fraction. And super responder was greater than 20% improvement in ejection fraction. And you can see um, very early on, as early as nine months um, after implant, 
um, survival is significantly impacted in the non-responding patients. And you can see those curves continue to spread out. Um, not all patients are super responders in this study. About 17% 17 of patients were the super responders. And we see those patients in clinic. You know, their EF goes back to the normal. They feel fantastic. And you wish it was like a light bulb, and all of our patients did that. So let's talk a little bit about how we improve response to cardiac resynchronization therapy. So some of the factors to think about with CRT um, is patient selection is one of them, um, adequate CRT programming, um, patient follow-up, CRT implant is important, and a multidisciplinary approach that involves both EP and heart failure. We can't be in our own silos, and I'm going to talk a little bit about that as well. So how do you define non-responder? There's not a uniform definition of non-responder nor specific treatment strategy. If you look across all the CRT trials, the early trials looked at, do patients feel better? Are they in the hospital less? We also looked at you know, mortality, but none of the studies are all uniform across the board. But what I can tell you is you want to see reverse remodeling. We want to see patients feeling better and staying out of the hospital. So we want the whole enchilada is what we'd like to see with patients. But if a patient doesn't have uh, reverse remodeling, but they're staying out of the hospital and they're feeling better and they're 80 years old, is that a win? I'd say probably it's a win, you know? But ideally, we'd like to see all of those outcomes improve. So patient selection, really key um, to uh, likelihood of uh, patient response. We know that QRS morphology, patients with left bundle branch block do better and are more likely to respond than patients with right bundle branch block. We know the wider the QRS complex, the more likely the patients are to respond. We know that in, in women respond um, more so than men do. Um, women with a little lower um, QRS width um, medical therapy. Patients need to be on optimal medical therapy. How many times do you refer a patient to EP and the patient says, oh, when I get that device, what pills can I stop? None. I'm going to push your pills afterwards. <laughs> um, so they need to know that going in. But we want them on as much drug that they'll tolerate before you put the device in. Um, if they've got poor RV function, if they've already got RV failure, they're less likely to respond. Myocardial viability. Remember the old phrase we learned, dead meat don't beat? Same thing if you're putting a pacing wire and the patient's got a lot of scar and you're trying to pace scar. So looking at MRIs ahead of time so we're staying away from scar areas and not pacing into those areas. Um, so generally, that, that's key uh, pre-implant. Um, mechanical dyssynchrony, they've got that. They're more likely to respond. And also, um, patients who have preserved or only mildly impaired renal function, those with, um, you know, those patients who are on dialysis and things like that, um, we see less of a response. Doesn't mean you shouldn't do it, but they're less likely to be responders. So this is an interesting study. This is a group out of Spain, and what they looked at was um, could we prospectively follow patients that we implant, look at variables, and come up with a tool uh, risk factors that predict mortality and those patients who are less likely to respond. And so they have zero risk factors, one risk factor, two, three, four. And looking at multivariate data, what they looked at were risk factors, what they came up with the most predictive risk factors of lack of response were those patients who had a very substantially reduced EF, less than 22 percent, age greater than or equal to 70. Patients who are in AFib, we know those patients um, don't quite do as well and across the CRT trials. Um, doesn't mean you shouldn't do it, but they, that's what's seen in trials. Um, those patients with class uh, GFR is less than 60 or stage 3 or worse renal function, NYHA class 4. And I think we, you know, when CRT first came out, we were implanting the 3s and the 4s. We've pulled that therapy back because we want to get them before they get to be that point. Uh, so the less sick patients do better. But you can see across the um, y-axis um, is survival, x-axis is years, and you can see those patients with no risk factors at 10 years do substantially better than those patients who have had multiple risk factors. So lead placement, and again, I'm not on the EP side, I'm not in the EP lab. Um, but um, my, one of my electrophysiologists when CRT came out actually built catheters and he has 
um, you know, catheter named after him um, for implant. Um, so he taught us very early on to look at a chest x-ray. And this is actually one of our patients. Uh, we call him Las Vegas man. Um, and he was a guy who was a traveling salesman, ended up um, going from city to city, uh, having heart failure hospitalizations. Well, he ended up in Lancaster with a heart failure hospitalization. And he initially was a non-responder to CRT. Um, if you look at uh, the x-ray, or the one that's labeled A, um, you want good separation between the RV and the LV lead. Um, and if you see um, you know, the LV and the RV lead, that's an anterior placement and that lead, you know, when they're implanting the LV lead, you want posterior lateral or in the lateral wall. Um, this position of the LV and the RV lead are very, very close together. So you're really not recruiting very much myocardium and you can actually make people worse. Um, with this type of configuration. So um, we actually diuresed the gentleman and repositioned his LV lead and uh, his response to CRT, actually he, re he was a responder uh, and did very well after that because um, every time he would travel through Lancaster he would stop in to see us. But you can see um, definite difference in lead position. Um, now this case was before quadrupolar leads and um, you know, the technologies that have come out over the last 10 years uh, with CRT for implant, um, much better uh, pacing strategies and ability to get leads where they need to go than there was a long time ago. Speaking of quadrupolar leads, all the companies have them, but looking at different pacing strategies to try and improve um, cardiac resynchronization therapy. Um, and there is multi multipolar pacing where you can pace two areas in the LV and the RV, so you're capturing more um, myocardium. That has been shown to actually uh, patients in studies response to CRT is 87%. So um, we see improvements with um, programming of uh, the device. I will tell you um, tomorrow, um, we have as a joint session between Heart Rhythm Society uh, and their um, allied professionals and our organization, a joint session. So I would encourage you, it's going to be fantastic on um, cardiac resynchronization therapy, on his bundle pacing, um, non-responder evaluation. It's a two-hour power hour with case studies, um, partnering with EP and heart failure. So really, really good session tomorrow afternoon, because um, I only have 20 minutes. I'm probably over my time. Um, I would recommend go to that session. So post-CRT implant, heart failure and EP, what's our jobs? Our job, optimize medical therapy before and after implant. Um, you know, sometimes after implant, if you get a hemodynamic response, patients are doing better, you can wean down their diuretics. Very often patients need less diuretics. And you have an opportunity um, very often to push their ACE, their ARB, their ARNI. Maybe if they couldn't get in an ARNI, get them on an ARNI, push their beta blockers, um, and push their therapies. And that's something I set up when I send them to the EP myself. I tell them, when I see you back, as I told you when I first met you, even if you feel well, I'm going to still push your medicines to you say uncle. Um, so really important. Optimize the device and device monitoring. So evaluate the LV lead position. Do you have LV capture? Are they by V pacing? That's very important. AV optimization. Um, you know, many patients are being left with their um, devices in out-of-the-box settings. The good thing with devices and, and all of the companies, they have strategies in their uh, programming now to try and ensure um, uh, CRT pacing, um, but if a patient is not responding, get back with your EPs because you may need to do AV optimization and really take a look at that. In office and remote interrogations, and what we do in our practice um, is we actually share between EP and heart failure all of the heart failure diagnostic data. So I can see a percentage of CRT pacing. I can see arrhythmias. I can see you know, all the device diagnostics within the devices. Um, and I don't take care of the shocks that the patient gets, but can I tell you how many patients who've gotten shocked and I'm like, okay, does this guy have advanced heart failure and are we missing this? Um, or you know, why is this person only 90% CRT pacing? We should be looking at this. This is not good for the patient. Um, so we take a look at that. Um, and EP looks at it from their perspectives and we work together. Again, ongoing patient education as far as adherence. Um, actually, one study looked at uh, patients post-CRT. 25% of patients stopped at least one guideline-directed medical therapy because they didn't think they needed it anymore. So patients need to know that they need to continue to take their medications. 
So factors associated with suboptimal response. So this is a study that actually looked at why are people not responding and what are some of the, what, what are some of the buckets that you see. So suboptimal AV timing. So again, AV optimization. Um, medical therapy um, or, uh, or uh, arrhythmias, excuse me, arrhythmias, so we see a lot of atrial fibrillation. Um, and you either need to drug it or you need to um, hisoblate them if you can't, uh, you know, do uh, AFib ablation. Uh, but that's um, a significant problem and reduces uh, pacing because the patient's overdriving their pacer and they're not getting full CRT uh, pacing. Um, the other issue we see with arrhythmias is we see PVC burden. And in the Made It CRT study, um, a low number of PVCs an hour, just 10 PVCs an hour, was shown to be a predictor for worsening heart failure um, and uh, worse outcomes for the patient. So if you're seeing that PVC burden is causing a reduction in, in by the pacing, that's somebody who may need a PVC ablation. Um, anemia, obviously treating their anemia, uh, less than 90% biventricular pacing, again, arrhythmias, um, and looking at programming. Do they, is their AV delay prolong, uh, too long, needs to be adjusted, and they're losing IV pacing for that. Suboptimal lead position, suboptimal medical therapy, um, patient uh, with uh, mechanical um, dyssynchrony, um, so do they need their LV lead reposition? Do we need to look at if they've got a quadrupolar lead? Can we do different vectors of pacing? Um, and that's something, you know, our EP colleagues uh, work very uh, closely with our industry colleagues to, to do optimal programming for the patient. Does the patient have an underlying narrow QRS? You know, so one of the things we sometimes see is um, creep of therapies into people who CRT may not benefit. Because, you know, we've all seen patients who are the super responders and you're like, yes, everybody should do this. And then the person has a narrow QRS and gets a CRT device, and that patient we can actually make worse if they really didn't meet indication for CRT. So going back and, you know, always look at the EKG pre-implant and then look at the EKG post-implant. You know, if they're QRS, you can drive a truck through um, post-implant. You know, are they truly by v pacing? You gotta look at the EKG. Um, and if the patient had a narrow QRS pre-implant, that CRT may actually be making the patient worse. So take a look at that. Compliance issues, you know, did the patient fall off the truck and just stop their medicines because they were feeling better? And do they have RV dysfunction? Because again, that will affect response to CRT. This slide, um, Again, yeah, I don't have to preach to the choir in this. Um, this is a looking at survival and CRT pacing. And basically, it looks at um, time post-implant on the x-axis and survival. And you can see very small reductions in BIV pacing is associated with significant reductions in survival. So your patient should be pacing as close to 100% of the time uh, as possible. This is a study. Um, from uh, Mass General, looking at multidisciplinary care with CRT. This is how we should be doing our care. Um, I would love to tell you in Lancaster we're doing this. Um, our physicians couldn't figure it out, and I'm going to do a proposal that maybe the NPs can figure out and pull the physicians as we need to. But what they did with this group is their, their hypothesis was if we work as a team, EP, heart failure, echo people, and we see patients regularly um, together, can we improve response to CRT? And so what they did is pre-discharge, patient got a device interrogation, chest x-ray, wound check. We all do that. At one month, they had echo-guided optimization. EP and heart failure saw them at the same time. So from our own lenses, you know, we see patients differently. We, we're looking at different things. Um, they have weird words. We have weird words on our side. But, you know, we're looking at patients from our lenses and optimizing their medications, EP is looking at, you know, is a lead in good position? Is a program right? Heart is looking at, are they on the right medicines? Six minute walk tests and quality life scores. Three months, again, another evaluation. Six month, another evaluation. Again, as teams, as the patient moves through their care. And what they saw with this in the patients that they prospectively followed, and they were randomized. Half the patients got standard of care, which is the usual silos of care and the other half of patients got this multidisciplinary care, you can see a 38% relative re risk reduction in the patients who, uh, and that's relative risk reduction in survival, heart failure hospitalization, transplant. So patients who had better outcomes. 
So non-responder evaluation um, requires a complete assessment of the patient, a relook to say, okay, let's back up the truck. This patient hasn't responded. What's going on? So history, medications. Is this patient compliant? Are they anemic? Are their thyroids out of whack? Is their blood sugar 10,000? You know, what does the lead placement look like? Are they having arrhythmias that are impacting it? Um, are they having, are they by the pacing? Um, what's their functional assessment pre and post? Um, doing a full device interrogation. Can you program to get a uh, better um, response? Echo, or, uh, echo AV optimization. And then looking at cardiac and non-cardiac causes. Do they have worsening ischemia? Are they volume overloaded? Are they dehydrated? Do they have right heart failure, arrhythmias again, non-cardiac causes, sleep apnea, thyroid abnormalities, anemia, depression, drug toxicity, um, deconditioning. And then device related. Heart failure diagnostics, what do they look like? AV and V2V optimization, device interrogation for LV capture, arrhythmias, and then again, lead position. Really important to kind of think about those things when you're looking at the patient. And certainly doing it from a multidisciplinary approach between EP teams and heart failure teams. So case study, six months after CRT. Initially, the patient did note improvement in CRT, um, NYHA class two. Uh, you can see medication-wise, we got to 12 and a half twice a day of carvedilol, valsartan, 40 milligrams a day, spironolactone, torsamide with varying, varying doses, uh, unable to tolerate uh, secubitrile valsartan due to hypotension. Unfortunately, at six months post-CRT, patient was NYHA class three and was re-hospitalized with heart failure. And you can see here, this patient, if we look at the definition of, um, of uh, appropriate response to CRT, this patient's echo EF was 25 to 30, or 20 to 25 percent moderate MR, and her LV diastolic diameter has actually gotten a little bit bigger from the first echo we did. So I would say this patient didn't really respond to CRT. So this is our protocol, and I'm going to skip it because it's kind of busy. Um, so, final thoughts, non-response to cardiac resynchronization therapy is still a major issue. Structured follow-up with regular visits to the device and heart failure providers is mandatory to improve outcomes and response to CRT, and I think that multidisciplinary approach is really needed. We need to figure out ways to see patients jointly. Device programs should aim to achieve 100% of complete and effective biventricular pacing. Suboptimal device program is one of the main reasons for lack of favorable CRT response, uh, but other factors need to be considered, and we talked about some of those. And collaboration between EP and heart failure teams is really key. So thank you. So I'm going to invite Mickey up. Good evening. So this patient, uh, <clears throat> once we deemed this patient a non-responder, and we were still monkeying around with this patient's diuretics, uh, we thought about screening this patient for a cardiomems. So who is appropriate for a cardiomems? Uh, the cardiomems heart failure sy uh, system is indicated for patients with New York Heart Class three heart failure who've had a heart failure hospitalization in the past 12 months. And as Lisa said, this patient had been hospitalized with an exacerbation of heart failure in the previous 12 months. Contraindications are patients with an inability to take dual antiplatelet therapy or anticoagulants for a month post implant. The following patients may not be appropriate for implantation. Patients, obviously, you're not going to uh, implant somebody with an active infection, somebody with a history of recurrent deep vein, thrombo, uh, deep vein thrombosis or pulmonary embolism. You're going to need a strategy for what you're going to do about that. Patients who are who can't lay on the cath lab table long enough to, to uh, have a right heart cath, patients with the GFR less than 25 or are unresponsive to diuretic therapy, you need a strategy for how you're going to remove fluid from, for this patient because once you put a cardiomems in them, you need to be able to manipulate their fluid volume, obviously. Patients with congenital heart disease, particularly right heart uh, disease or mechanical right heart valves because you need to be able to pass that right heart valve. Uh, patients with known coagulopathies or hypersensitivity or allergy to aspirin and uh, or clopidogrel, if you can't also give them warfarin. Patients who've undergone implantation of CRTD within the past 
three months. Uh, and, and patients need to be optimized on therapy, guideline-directed therapy. Patients with a, uh, a BMI greater than 35 kilograms per meter squared or, uh, uh, and a chest circumference greater than 165 centimeters. So how, what I do with men is I generally ask them what their sport coat size is to kind of get a rough idea. And women, you got to remember not to, me you got to ask them what their bra band size is. Because remember, you don't want to measure around the boobs because the boobs are in front. It's not going to impact the cardiomems, right? So remember that when you're, I'm sorry, when you're, yeah, when you're, when you're screening women, you know, they get a little bit more leeway because of the, yeah. Because of, of the chassis, it gets a little different. Yeah. So, who is the right patient for cardiomems? Again, in New York Heart Thrust Class 3 patient, the patients that you're doing the frequent wet-dry, you know, what, are they wet, are they dry, you're increasing the, the diuretics, you're decreasing the diuretics. Somebody, again, who's optimized on medical and device therapy. Somebody who's able and willing to adhere to a monitoring schedule. That patient's got to lie on the pillow and do a reading for you. If they're not compliant with any of their other medical therapy, they're not going to be compliant doing this. So they need to be fairly compliant. And they need to be able to adjust their medicines as directed. It can't be somebody who said, well, my daughter's coming next week, so she'll be able to add the medications next week. Or somebody that has their pills packed for them, and, and you can't adjust their therapies. They need, or they need to have a friend who can do it for them. I have no idea what's going on here. Or who's driving this train, really? <laughs> exactly, right? So who's the right patient? Well. You know, patient, again, whose fluid volumes are hard to know or manage. Uh, physical assessment is challenging. I wish all of my patients had beautiful swan-like necks like this lady. This, uh, this, was a, this was a patient of mine. I mean, you can't miss this one, right? Yeah. Or this lady. This is, this is, this is really one of my patients. Lenore and I were in the clinic uh, on a Friday afternoon at 4.30 in the afternoon. Her daughter wheeled her across the courtyard and said, we were just discharged from the hospital and we were I was told to take my mom home and, and let her die. Is there anything that you can do for her? Of course, this was Friday afternoon at 4.30 and we wheeled her right back to the hospital, readmitted her, diaries 30 pounds off of her and this is what she looked like when she went home. Now, she's not perfect, but she's a lot better, right? And she actually lived for another seven years, was not back in the hospital for seven years. Yeah, and she got to celebrate, that's true, she, she celebrated her 50th anniversary at home with her kids. And actually what happened to her was she fell getting up to the bathroom, broke her hip, wound up in, and wound up in the hospital and, you know, just deteriorated after that. It was really very sad. She was a wonderful, wonderful lady, wonderful family. She had, what, seven, seven kids? She had seven kids, I think, yeah. Anyway, um, patients with, with a physical... Uh, it, uh, patients could be half, 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 or half, half. Patient needs to be compliant. Oh, and, and here's another, here's another kit. Now, I got to ask. So this lady has terrible TR. I have to ask, what's the most you've ever diuresed from a patient? Who said 100? How about 110? How about 110? 120? So what is that, 130 pounds? Something like, I diuresed 140 pounds from this patient. 110 pounds of it was in the hospital. We did the rest at home. She was almost 400 pounds. She's about 240 now. And she was bedridden for a year. She's driving a car, living her life. and very, But she's got this terrible TR. And I tell you, she has not a drop of fluid on her, but she has this torrential TR. So, you know, looking at her neck veins is not really helpful. So, you know, again, her assessment is, is difficult. Um, so, uh, you know, and, and patients that would benefit from remote monitoring because they don't live close to the clinic. So that's a great patient for cardiomems. And this guy. There's a, yeah, I mean, some patients, you just, you can't even figure out, like, where their head starts and their neck begins. Yeah, yeah. okay. So, so, uh, 
So, you know, when you're talking to patients about cardiomems, it's really good to talk to them as they're going home or during their first uh, post-clinic visit, uh, pre-clinic visit, uh, you know, because they've just had the experience of being in the hospital and, you know, they want to stay euvolemic and out of the hospital because it's been so much fun being in the hospital. So that's a great time to talk to them about the benefits of pressure management and talk to them about what your, their responsibilities would be like. They need to lay on the pillow every day. You know, they're going to be getting phone calls. They're going to be manipulating their meds. Uh, they need to know what the pillow looks like, what the setup looks like, you know, that they're going to have to move their furniture around in their bedroom. It's another, another device in their bedroom that, you know, yes, you know, if they have a CRT, it, you know, they need to make room on their bedside table, et cetera, et cetera. <clears throat> so, um, but it is going to help you stay ahead of their heart failure, oftentimes before they have symptoms and that it's going to optimize the quality of their life and reduce hospitalizations. We just implanted somebody, and I live in a Novitas state, so this is a pain in the neck, but we actually sent them across the bridge to a hospital and had them implanted, and he's somebody that, he said, for the first time in two years, he has more good days than bad days because uh, it, we're just staying ahead of his fluid. So it really, it really does work. So where to find uh, patients during a hospitalization for acute heart failure, during a clinic visit, where again, you're just you know, up on the diuretics, down on the diuretics, trying to divine what their fluid volume is. Um, after a diagnostic test that identifies a patient, so you know, when I look at an echo and I see that their IVC is dilated and I didn't think they were volume overloaded, uh, or by, by referral from community. My friend uh, Irene gets referrals from community hospitals that don't implant, but they get implanted and then they optimize the patient, send them back, and then co-manage them for a bit. So, and again, I, I'm now in the, in the position of having to do that myself. I just send the patients, they get implanted, and then I get them back and then manage them. So, uh, you know, I'm sure that we're all familiar with what a New York heart class three patient is, they have marked limitations of physical activity, they're comfortable at rest, and less than ordinary activity causes fatigue, palpitations, or dyspnea. Uh, we've certainly expanded our definition of heart failure, but for the purposes of this talk, I'm just going to talk about preserved ejection fraction and reduced ejection fraction. And we know that both of these types of patients benefit from cardiomems. Now, we used to think that the patients with preserved ejection fraction actually did better and lived longer, but we know that they, uh, but actually from studies, that they actually die at exactly the same rate as patients with reduced ejection fraction. Uh, and that patients with preserved ejection fraction don't do well if their pulmonary pressures are high. From this study, patients with pulmonary arterial systolic pressures of greater uh, or equal to 48 had a much lower survival curve than patients with lower pulmonary pressures. And despite the fact that it, heart failure with preserved ejection fraction is so prevalent, other than spironolactone, we don't have guideline-directed care for these patients. So we need to aggressively manage the underlying comorbidities that worsen the disease and cause disease progression. We know we need to control blood pressure and heart rate, but in addition to that, the guidelines say we need to normalize their pulmonary capillary wedge pressure, we need to do guideline-directed hemodynamic therapy, and they need volume management. It's first-line therapy for these patients. So what better way to do it than through ongoing cardiomens management with pulmonary, pulmonary artery pressure management? And indeed, in the CHAMPION study, in a pre-specified subgroup analysis, the patients with preserved ejection fraction had a 50% decrease in hospitalizations. They did even better than the patients with reduced ejection fraction. And that makes sense, because in these patients, little differences in volume make big differences in pressure. Right? Okay. So getting back to our case study, and I, I, I made her a little bit older. Sorry about that. <clears throat> but her ejection fraction is still the same. So she was on good guideline-directed medical therapy, uh, as our patients should be on when they're implanted. Right? And what do we need to do then? And again, you can add, 
add in, and for those of you that are not familiar with, um, uh, with cardiomems, those squiggly lines there are her systolic, diastolic, <clears throat> and mean pressures there. The red is the systolic, the green is the diastolic pressure, and the blue is the mean. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show you some other things uh, in a little bit. And then you can add in the right heart uh, cath details. So her, so her uh, right atrial pressure was 7, which is not so terribly volume overloaded. Uh, but her PA pressures were 53 over 18 with a mean of 33. So her pulmonary pressures were high. Right? And, and uh, so uh, my collaborative physician wanted me to diurese her. I did not really feel that she was volume overloaded. And I kind of had to argue with him because her, her RA pressure was, was not high. And I, I did try and diurese her, and I bumped her creatinine way up. So, you know, and again, because her RA pressure was not high, right? She just had pulmonary hypertension, and I'll, you'll see why she had pulmonary hypertension in a little bit. It was really because of her MR. And you'll see her MR in a little bit. So she was on uh, alternating doses of uh, torsamide uh, 20 and 20, alternating with 20 milligrams daily at implant. Um, her, uh, her wedge was 11, so she did have a little bit of a, of a, of a diastolic gradient there, telling me that, you know, she was having a little bit of, of, uh, of uh, reactive disease in her, in her uh, pulmonary arteries because of that MR, and uh, her cardiac output was 4. And I will tell you that she was on milrinone at this point. She was on a milrinone infusion at 0 0.5 mics per kilo per minute. Okay. So this is a reading uh, over time of her PA pressures in. And her target was about 14, 15, 16. And you can see that she was pretty good about keeping, you know, she did bump up here and, and, and there. And I just want to point out this, this 8 over here for one day, and I didn't really say anything because it, it, it kind of came and went in one day. And, but you see it happened again about a week later. <clears throat> and this was a patient that I was, uh, I was very close to. This does happen to be my patient. And she was somebody that I, I, I texted almost every single day from the time she was diagnosed to this cardiomems implant. And, uh, this happened again. I called her up on the phone. I, I pretty much texted her every day unless something was really going on. And then if something was really going on, she got a phone call from me. She got a call me text. And she knew if she got a call me text, something was up. And if she knew she'd been bad, she sometimes didn't call me. <laughs> but she got a call me text. And she called me, and, and she called me back and she'd go like, what? <laughs> So I said, uh, your, your PAG was really low. And she's she very smart. Your PAG was really low. She said, yeah, I know. I went out with my friends, and I had three margaritas. <laughs> and silence on the phone. I said, do you know what the guidelines say about alcohol consumption for heart failure patients? She said, of course I know. You taught me. Two alcoholic beverages for women. I'm sorry, two alcoholic beverages for men and one for women. She said, why do you think I took extra torsamide? <laughs> I said, okay, what? I said, okay, let me, diag let me dose the diuretics <clears throat> from now on. So we agreed that I would dose the diuretics and she would not proactively up titrate them until she heard from me. So we kind of made that agreement. So here she was, in, and you can see this is uh, March, and, and she's really pretty much staying on target here. And pretty much after that, I did dose the, di the diuretics. But you know, here we are in the spring through the summer, and she's on 20 BID, um, you can see. So I like to turn the heart rate on and off. Um, as you can see, there are, there are uh, things along the top here that are, I don't have a pointer, but there are, are uh, things that are highlighted and things that are kind of turned off along the top row there. 
the PA systolic is dark and the PA uh, systolic trend is kind of grayed out there. If you tap on those things, you can bring up those lines. So I have the dark purple there is the heart rate trend. I like to look at that to see how the heart rate's trending over time. I don't usually leave it on because sometimes it's right smack in the middle of your, your systolic trend. Um, and you see I have the diastolic trend line turned on on the bottom because I like to see how my numbers are trending. That's a 30-day rolling trend on both of those. And can you see that my diastolic is trending up there towards the middle of the screen? Well, that kind of got my attention and I started to up titrate her diuretics. And I, you know, again, I, this is somebody that I talked to on the phone a lot and, and texted a lot with and we were very much in touch. And um, I knew that her diet was not worse than usual and that, you know, she was behaving herself and she's still trending up as I'm escalating her diuretics. And here she's on 100 of torsamide daily and I'm starting to really get concerned. And towards when she first started to trend up here, we've been having conversations about thinking about going to a VAD and talk, we'd been talking about transplant and she'd been hesitant. She'd had a discussion with the VAD coordinator, coordinator at my sister hospital at this point and she was not really interested. Um, and uh, we were not pushing her hard. Um, but at this point, um, I pushed her to go, to the, go into the hospital for an evaluation, and I'll show you why. So for those of you that don't get to look at echoes every day like I do, I kind of put the pictures of what we're looking at here. So that first picture is what we call a parasternal long axis, so you're kind of looking at the profile of the heart and all that blue stuff coming backwards is blood squirting backwards through the mitral valve. And that the middle is the four chamber view and you can just see that she's got torrential mitral regurge there. And that two chamber view really shows you just how she's got, you know, flow pouring backwards from the, from the, from the ventricle in, into, the, in, in, into the left atrium. And that's really what the problem was. Her, her MR was just getting so bad that it was on her diet, it, you know, she was doing everything she was supposed to be doing, but her MR was just so bad. And unfortunately, uh, you know, we had talked about, about fixing her functional mitral regurge, and COAPT had not finished at that point. You know, we discussed it several times, and there was at that point no evidence so functional mitral regurg, as you know, is associated with poor long-term long survival. The valve itself is structurally normal, but what happens is the leaflets don't collapse because of, of the annulus stretching, because of the, the dilatation of the, uh, <clears throat> um, of the ventricle itself. And as the, as the, the MR gets worse, uh, it often ends in irreversible left ventricular dysfunction. So the COAP trial was 814 patients with symptomatic heart failure and three to four plus mitral regurg on maximally tolerated guideline-directed therapy uh, who were randomized to either a mitral clip uh, and guideline-directed therapy or standard therapy. Patients were followed for 24 months. Uh, it was a landmark trial. Uh, it resulted in a 38 relative risk reduction in mortality and a 47% uh, percent reduction uh, in relative risk uh, of hospitalization. So uh, probably was not really the answer for this patient, but you know, it was something that we were thinking about all along. Now, you know, we've been doing the Alfieri stitch back when I was just getting out of uh, nursing school. Uh, and the reason that they sometimes did an Alfieri stitch was that it resulted in a, a double outlet valve. And the benefit of it was you could do it directly when you were fixing the aortic valve just by reaching through the aortic valve and, and, 
and putting in a stitch. I don't know if anybody is as old as I am and remembers, but yeah, a few people in the back over there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, this is the approach that's done. This is a, you know, this is done as a procedure. And it kind of reminds me of an alfieri stitch because the outcome is the same. It results in a, in a double outlet uh, aortic valve. And I actually stole this off of YouTube. Let's make sure it works here. Here, so you're going through the septum here. There's the guide wire. There's the delivery catheter or the device. It's very, it's very steerable. Look at how cool this is. And this is all done, positioned via echocardiography in the lab. So base, I'm sorry? Yeah. So you reach through and grasp the leaflets and find a favorable, a favorable position that mitigates as much of the MR as you can. And during the study, patients got an average of 1.7 clips. Not that people got a half a clip, but you know, some people got more than one. So you figure out what the best positioning for the clip is. And once you have the best position, you deploy the clip. And there it is. I've had several patients that have had mitroclips and it's, it's been very beneficial. It's really decreased hospitalizations, and, uh, and there you go. Results may vary. <laughs> okay, so why an LVAD evaluation for this patient? Well, she had worsening symptoms and rising PA pressures and the need for escalation of diuretic therapy. By the time she went to the hospital, her, PA, her PAD was in the, in the low 20s, despite escalation of, of her torsamide. And she was taking her meds and, and minding her diet. And I was up her butt every day about it. Um, she was, uh, there was poor likelihood of cardiac recovery given uh, uh, given scarring found on the MRI. There was high pulmonary pressures and worsening mitral regurg. Uh, and there were changes in the organ allocation system and likelihood of long waiting time on the transplant list. And also her very high pr uh, pulmonary pressures at the time precluded transplant. Uh, and she had a moderately high BMI, so that may have held up her getting transplanted at the time. And the HeartMate 3 had just been released, so she had reliable long-term support uh, possible from an LVAD. So with, uh, without further ado, I'm going to sit down and hand over the controls. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you, Mickey. OK, so let's take a step back from our patient. And none of my patients look like this either in Minnesota. We're a little get her prepared for winter. Uh, so we've heard a lot about the staggering statistics of heart failure today. But let's look at the statistics of advanced heart failure. Roughly 1.5 million adults in the United States have advanced heart failure, of which more than 25,000 are appropriate candidates for advanced therapies. Almost 300,000 patients die of heart failure in the United States each year. And despite a blockbuster year in transplant last year, there were only 3,400 heart transplants in the United States. This supply-demand mismatch has contributed to significant evolution in the world of mechanical circulatory support. How many of you remember the XVE? Oh, yeah. Do you remember how big it was? It was giant. No offense. 
folks. Uh, it was really large. It was really, it was pulsatile. The, I think the coolest part about it was the little hand pump you could keep. Uh, I was always mesmerized by that, that if you ran out of batteries or you had some electronic malfunction, you literally hooked up a hand pump and you pumped until help arrived. Um, so really cool. Uh, nevertheless, gigantic and it had, um, we, we've improved a lot. Roughly 10 years after the XVE came out, the HeartMate 2 came out, it's been implanted in more than 26,000 patients. It had new engineering with axial flow. And then most recently, the HeartMate 3. Oh, and just to go back, HeartMate 2 was the device that our speaker this morning had. Um, so we've come a long way just since he got his device. HeartMate 3 is the most recent development. Um, in 2017, it was approved for bridge to transplant and then last year for destination therapy. And we're going to review some of the data shortly. So hindsight is 2020. We're reviewing our case right now and we can all probably pinpoint a, a date in every patient's course where we're like, oh, we probably should have seen that one coming. However, when we're in the thick of it, we're not actually very good at recognizing advanced heart failure. We're statistically across the country, we're actually pretty bad at it. So that's why in 2017, the ACC developed this, um, what do you call these mnemonic. things? Mnemonic, thank you. Um, I don't know what was in my mind. A mnemonic called I Need Help. I standing for IV inotropes. Remember, our patient is on melanone already. In for New York Heart Association, class 3B slash 4 with persistently elevated or persistently elevated natriuretic peptides. E for end organ dysfunction. E for ejection fraction less than 35%. Defibrillator shocks for D or ventricular arrhythmias. H for hospitalizations. E for edema or elevated PA pressures, again, our patient. L for low blood pressure and high heart rate. Recall when Lisa was talking, we could barely get her on a whiff of uh, gold guideline directed medical therapy. And we actually, actually had to cut back on our beta blocker and she didn't tolerate Entresto. So there's, these should be ringing some bells. Um, and then that brings us to P, prognostic medication or progressive intolerance of GDMT. Other factors you want to look for, cardiac cachexia, you know when that patient walks in and they've got temporal wasting, the giant belly, and they tell you, I'm short of breath, and you look at their neck veins and they're up to here, but they're losing weight, that's a bad sign. So unintentional weight loss. Yeah. Also, I always look at the ventricle size. Lisa had several slides that showed that when this patient was introduced to us, I think her LV was like 5.3 centimeters. And three months later, we've gotten her on meds and now she's 5.9 centimeters. So her LV is actually growing rather than getting smaller. And finally, a gold standard for measuring functional capacity in heart failure is your uh, maximal oxygen, oxygen consumption from a cardiopulmonary stress test. So less than 14 would be a trigger. This is an outdated, but I love it, decision tree. I love it because it gives us clear direction. There's no ambiguity. I find sometimes our, our most recent guidelines have a lot of, pick one. Um, but this one gives us really clear direction. So as I mentioned, the peak VO2 of less than 14, you can see the other indications to initiate a heart transplant or LVAD evaluation. And in our case, our patient had a slightly high BMI and she had a high PVR, so she was not currently eligible for transplant. Nevertheless, an LVAD should be considered. So VADs should be, con they're indicated for people in bridge to transplant, myocardial recovery, and destination therapy. The only actual contraindication to LVAD implant is an intolerance or an allergy to anticoagulation. There are lots of other things to consider, of course, and I'll tell you that our transplant VAD meetings are not fun, and they usually are massively focused on this left column, the psychosocial factors. These are the hard ones, these are the ethical ones, these are the really tough decisions and soul-searching decisions where you have to decide really difficult things. And most of us are kind of scientists at the bottom of it, and so we like that right-hand column because it's a little more measurable, it's, measure, it's objective, it's easier to define. However, when you get to those latter three items on the physical factors, so end organ disease, severe right ventricular dysfunction, and frailty, you have to worry that you might have wished, missed your window. 
Intermax profile is a, a system for categorizing advanced heart failure into classes of one through seven. Your class one and two are really your, these are, these are horrible situations. So pro, Intermax one is your crash and burn. This person is in the ICU probably on ECMO, if not on ECMO, a balloon pump, multiple vasoactive medications, really sick. Intermax 2 is pretty darn close. They're usually also in the ICU on a couple of inotropes, probably thinking about a balloon pump. Now they've got renal dysfunction. You're, they're really sliding. Everybody else, Intermax 3 through 7, as you can see, it gets progressively more stable. And really, the window of opportunity, once you get to Intermax 1 and 2, we know that their risks of adverse outcomes with that implant are significantly greater. This is a summary of the potential adverse events from the Momentum 3 trial. Highlighted is bleeding, stroke, and device thrombosis. These are the three that we most commonly talk about, and if you recall, our speaker this morning experienced bleeding and stroke. He was fortunate without the device thrombosis. The good news is the Momentum 3 trial data came out this spring. It was presented at ACC and published in the New England Journal of Medicine. It's pretty remarkable, it's pretty exciting. Um, it has the lowest published rates for continuous flow LVADs, this is the HeartMate 3, the lowest published rates for continuous flow LVADs for stroke and pump thrombosis at 10 and 1% respectively. At the same time, and keep in mind this is one, the largest LVAD trial done ever, unprecedented survival, 79% at two years. We live in Minnesota, as I mentioned, and we have a lot of farmers, if not farmers, engineers, and I, I had no idea there was so much technology in Minnesota. And so when I get a farmer who comes in and we're tar starting to talk about an LVAD, the easiest way for me to describe it is a sump pump. <laughs> and they get it. You say, we're going to put a sump pump in your heart so that when your fluid levels get high, it continually keeps the fluid out of the basement. So why would we even consider putting a sump pump in someone's heart? This is why. VADs have the potential to help people live longer and the survival is on par with heart transplant. The HeartMate 3 LVAD has a 79% two year survival. Heart transplant at this point has an 82% survival. Furthermore, VADs help people live better. It isn't just living longer, it's living better. The Momentum 3 trial showed that patients had a marked and sustained improvement in symptoms, improved quality of life, improved six minute walk test distance, and had fewer hospitalizations and hospital days. So all of you that raised your hand that you remember the XVE, do you remember we thought of VAD as like this last ditch effort? Mm -hmm. And we were crazy. We were crazy. Remember when people walked around the hallway with their VADs, <laughs> this giant machine, like it was as big as this podium? Look how far we've come. This is remarkable data, and you have to think, if you don't put VADs in and you've been discouraged about VAD data and thought it's just a horrible course, you have to be reassured by this data that it's worth it. So let's go back to that, our patient, now that we're reassured. So as Mickey mentioned, our patient, she came in with for a right heart cath. She was already on melanone. Her wedge pressure was high at 35. Her RA pressure was nine. This is particularly a worrisome sign because even when her volume status is controlled, she's in heart failure. Mickey already alluded to that very well. Her cardiac index on melanone at a healthy dose of five mics per keg per minute is only 1.8. She needs more help. So we added a second inotrope, dibutamine. We added a drip just to control her volume status and we placed an urgent LVAD referral. Before patients undergo LVAD, we need to make sure that they're tuned up appropriately. That includes optimizing the right ventricular function, which is, is you know, controlling RA pressure so that you're gonna hear that repeatedly in the next couple of slides. Lower the pulmonary vascular resistance. Keep in mind she's already on melanone, which will help with that. An elective balloon pump implant. We have one surgeon that puts it in on every planned VAD. And we have another surgeon who's kind of, eh, it just depends on the day. Uh, 
Coagulation, uh, we, we want to address that. We're going to have major surgery, so if they don't need to be anticoagulated, they shouldn't be. Of course, bridging with heparin is necessary. And if they have any evidence of liver congestion, we need to diurese them. Again, reducing the right atrial pressures. We need to assure that they are nutritionally intact and can tolerate a major surgery and the recovery. And infection control, if they have any current infection or they have a tooth that looks abscessed or any of those things, we need to get that taken care of before implanting. Fortunately, our patient was quite tuned up to begin with, and I also made her 38 years old. <laughs> I made her younger. younger yeah, always. Um, she fortunately had an uneventful perioperative course. She was weaned off bypass, uh, though she did have moderately reduced RV function in the OR. She was directly admitted to the ICU, sedated and intubated. Her pump speed was set at 5,400 when she came into the unit. She had a flow of 5 liters per minute, an RA pressure of 16, a PA pressure of 44 over 24, and a mean arterial pressure of 85. She came into the unit on epi, norepi, and milrinone. In that immediate post-operate period, typically in the ICU, our goals for hemodynamics are to, again, I'm back to the right atrial pressure, keep it 10 to 14. The MAP should be 70 to 80, and this should be measured either by an art line, if not a Doppler. We're going to wean support. Typically, we start with the vasopressors and then the inotropes. Because we hope to make this patient a transplant candidate, we're going to be very judicious with our transfusions. And then we initiate anticoagulation and antiplatelets pretty much right away if there's no bleeding, bleeding um, issues. We're also going to wean the vent support as soon as oxygenation is adequate, secretions are controlled, and of course when the patient is hemodynamically stable. In the background of both hemodynamics and ventilator support is we're really we're trying to protect the right ventricle. I, before coming to cardiology, I was a surgical trauma nurse, and we always said, we had an explicit in there, but I'll tame it, um, <laughs> don't mess with the pancreas. <laughs> don't mess with the pancreas. And that was the world in surgery. In heart failure, it's don't mess with the RV. Um, and so here, to avoid right heart failure, we're going to adjust our vent settings to reduce intrathoracic pressure by adjusting PEEP and the inspiration to expiration ratio. We're slowly going to wean the inotropes because keep in mind they support the RV as well. If the patient has pulmonary hypertension, we're going to consider nitrous oxide. We call it um, jet fuel. Um, we're going to minimize RV pacing at this point because we don't want to, uh, you know, your RV is already worn out and it's a little bit stunned. And then we're going to adjust our pump speed. If you think about it, we put that sump pump in the left ventricle, and all that's coming back now to the right side. So we've just substantially increased the preload to the right side of the heart. And sometimes your RV is probably not in the best shape anyways, and now the geometry of the heart is a little quirky, and now we just overwhelmed our right ventricle. So we need to make sure that we adjust our pump speed so that we're adequately unloading the left ventricle, but not overwhelming the right ventricle. To do that, we use echo imaging and we use our Swan-Gans catheter to adjust both sides of the heart. So we did just that. Our patient on post-op day three had an RA pressure of 20, a wedge pressure of four, and an index of 1.2. So this is almost the inverse of before. Now her right-sided pressures are elevated, her left-sided pressures are low, and she still doesn't have any cardiac index. So we get a bedside echo. Her LV dimensions are pretty small, 4.9 centimeters. I don't know, could anybody tell me the cannula size? I think it's like 4.2, 4.3? The VAD cannula outflow? Anyways, it's small. It's not much smaller than 4.9 centimeters. So if you think about the left ventricle is getting, it's shrink, if, if this was the cannula and this is my left ventricle, my, can, my ventricle is shrinking around the cannula. And if it gets much smaller, it's going to be as small as the cannula. So, her LV is getting small. Her aortic valve is opening only every four to five beats. Her septum is bowing slowly, slightly right to left. So now her left ventricle is tiny, and her right ventricle is gigantic, and it has severely reduced function. So we've put her in right heart failure. So what are we going to do? We're going to continue the melanone because it's good for both sides of the heart. We're going to diurese her. 
will consider a phosphodiesterase inhibitor such as Bravadio to dilate the pulmonary vasculature. We're going to reduce or discontinue any beta blockade because of its negative inotropic effects. And we're going to slow that pump down. We're going to slow her down to 5,100 RPMs. Fortunately, that was her only real hiccup during her hospitalization. She was discharged to home on post-op day 10. There's a lot of words on there, but I'll summarize. She did good. She went home. <laughs> she went home on post-op day 10. Rock star, right? Post-op day 10, post-vad, well done. She returns to clinic on post-op day 17 for an optimization echo. So what an optimization echo is, basically, we adjust the speeds of the pump and we take snapshots of what the heart's doing at each speed. What we try to do is get the patient to the point where their left ventricle is appropriately unloaded, so this ch the chamber is smaller, but not too small. The aortic valve is opening uh, every two to three beats. There's no aortic insufficiency, and the septum is right perfect in the midline. So as you can see here, at a speed of 4,800 RPMs, her left ventricle is getting bigger, again, back to almost pre-implant, 5.6. Her aortic valve is opening every other beat, so a little too frequently. No AI, of course. But her septum is bowing from right, left to right. Ooh, those angles don't make it easy. Left to right. So now her LV is big, her RV is fine. We're going too slow. And as you can see in the speed column, as we speed up, the LV dimensions get smaller. The aortic valve opens less frequently, and at the highest speed of 5,300 on the test, she develops some mild aortic insufficiency. And at the highest speeds, her septum started shifting from left to right, so again, pushing her into right-sided failure. So her sweet spot would be in that 5,000 to 5,100 range, where her LV is pretty good size, opening every two to three beats for the aortic valve, no aortic insufficiency, and the septum is midline. Now, at every clinic visit, you don't have this to guide you. You kind of have to put all the pieces together. We do the optimization echo at our program roughly one to two weeks post-discharge when we feel like we've got a good handle on their volume situation, we're starting to start some of their heart failure meds back up, and we're really just starting to optimize. And then anytime we kind of hit a wall with therapy or the patient's symptomatic and I just can't figure out what's going on. Can we speed him up? Eh, I don't know. We'll do another one. And never underestimate the value of a right heart cath. Never. Um, so what you will do on every post-op clinic visit is monitor anticoagulation, antiplatelet, and thrombus. Now this is a really busy slide, and I won't talk through every detail. But essentially, this is the program or the protocol we use to manage post-op anticoagulation and INR management. Essentially, we start early. Um, on post-op day one, we start a 325 milligram aspirin, and we keep them on 325 until their, their INR is therapeutic when we cut down to 81 milligrams. They're on fixed-dose heparin at 48 hours, and on post-op day two through five, depending on their bleeding situation, we initiate Coumadin. And then, of course, once therapeutic, a goal of two to three, we discontinue the heparin. We monitor an INR at least weekly for the first three months post-discharge, and then as needed with changes. Our Coumadin clinic has a specific order set, and we've looked at do they do better, do we do better? They do better. Um, so they manage our INRs, with, and sometimes we give them gentle prods. If the INR is subtherapeutic, if it's drastically subtherapeutic, um, and there are no contraindications, we do use anoxaparin to bridge patients until they're therapeutic. If it goes on and on and on that they're subtherapeutic, they're getting admitted and getting heparin. If it's just a titch low, like 0.5, and now with this new data we just talked about the, the, with the reduced rates of thrombosis, we're a little more relaxed, we used to freak out. And now, uh, if it's just a titch low, we'll, up, we'll escalate, and there's a removable cause, maybe they harvested a bunch of kale, you know, <laughs> stop, <laughs> stop eating your kale, we'll check your INR in three days, or escalate that, the Coumadin dose in three days, my computer just went off, oh, it's on, excuse me, um, 
So that's essentially how we manage INR. If they're super therapeutic, you know, if it's really high, then we're drawing a, an actual blood sample to double check it. If they have any evidence of bleeding, we kind of resist giving vitamin K and whatnot until we know that there's any bleeding. Um, and of course, at any point in this algorithm, if they have any evidence of hemolysis, so a doubling of the LDH, any um, T-colored urine, or any power changes, then we're bringing them in to get them checked over. Also, at every clinic visit, you're going to do driveline management. Another busy slide. Um, basically, at our site, we do a daily dressing change, and we do require that the patient has a caregiver do their dressing changes using sterile technique. I know that's different everywhere. Uh, but we do a daily dressing change until the, until the driveline site is completely sealed. It should look like a belly button with a tube coming out of it. And um, once it's sealed, we transition from the daily dressing change to a weekly dressing change with a clear window. Patients drop their controllers. They get snagged on doorknobs, whatnot. So if you have a known trauma to the site, but the seal is unbroken and there's no drainage, we just keep an eye on it. We go back to the daily dressing changes. Sometimes I encourage patients to take a picture every day just so we can see what's going on. But if they break the seal, no drainage, sore, little red, we go ahead and start antibiotics. We empirically treat with doxycycline. Um, and if it's low key, we're good. We just check in with them. Again, go back to the daily dressing changes. However, if it's the seal is broken, it's draining, their white counts up, any of those things, we are bringing them into clinic where we add a CRP to their labs. We do a wound and blood cultures. We start um, doxycycline and we schedule them to follow up with our infectious disease team in three to five days because by then you'll have the wound cultures back. Of course, if there's any hint that there's some uh, abscess brewing or something along the driveline tract, we're getting a CT scan um, and potentially admitting at that point. Worst case scenario, if a patient comes in with systemic symptoms, fever, chills, malaise, um, then we are admitting to our surgical team starting IV Vank, Sosin, CT, the, whole, the, full, the full nine yards. It's easy to forget that our LVAD patients still have heart failure, and you still have to get back to the fundamentals of heart failure, which of course are ACE, ARBs, ARNIs, beta blockers, et cetera. We oftentimes, our patients are discharged from the hospital not on an ACE or ARB, but are on a baby dose of hydralazine. Sometimes the inpatient team is just like, you know, they're creatinine bumped after surgery, and we're still diuresing, and we don't want to we don't want to confound any renal dysfunction by adding an ACE at this point. So we often do resume the ACE, ARB, or ARNI um, in baby doses, like just like you're starting over. Um, but we wait until we've kind of stopped throwing every diuretic in the book at them or withdrawing every diuretic. We just wait till things kind of settle down a little bit. Likewise with beta blockers, if our patients have any sign or if it looks, smells, anything like right-sided heart failure, we're really reluctant to start that beta blocker. If we do, we start it at a very small dose and we keep a very close eye on them. That's not to say that we don't get there. We do, but we do so cautiously. Aldosterone antagonists, hydralazine, nitrates, etc. Same old heart failure, same thing. Loop diuretics are still a necessary evil for many LVAD patients, as is the case for our patient who um, I'm happy to say started full-time employment as a patient transporter. And um, turns out loop diuretics kind of get in the way. And it's kind of hard to move patients around when you have to pee all the time. So there was a spell where the loop diuretics weren't quite as consistent as usual, but our patient started to get more symptomatic. She, she was, Mickey said, she's smart. She was onto it. So she quickly got back on track, and as you can see here, this is a snapshot of her cardio mems just from last week with a beautiful waveform. And look at those PA diastolic pressures in the single digits. Never happens. It's amazing, it's beautiful. And the best news that we have yet today is that our case study is an actual human being, and she's here with us tonight. So, 
without further ado, I'd like to introduce Gina and uh, see if we can get her perspective on things, if she's ready to come up. Thank you so much. Good evening. Can you hear me? Yes. I'm a little short, so. Um, so that case study is a little tough to watch because I went through it all. Uh, down? Um, so I'll do a brief introduction about myself. I am 39 years young. I, um, <clears throat> I uh, met Mickey a little while ago, about three years ago, um, while I was admitted into the ER. And ever since then, she's been a huge part of my life. <clears throat> um, I am a, a current New Jersey State registered EMT, so I know a little more than most. So not all your patients know. <clears throat> so I went from saving lives to having my life saved. Um, and I was compliant <laughs> with all my medications except for the Lasix and the margaritas. <laughs> <laughs> Whoops. <laughs> Sorry. Um, so my, my most important thing basically is to tell my story, and I'll make it as brief because it's pretty long as possible. Um, I started off with a cold, and it got worse, and um, now I'm here, but I'm, I'm blessed to be here. Um, my most important thing is I advocated for myself. Some patients can't. Some don't know how. Some don't know what to ask. Um, I was a little blessed with having a little EMT background because for me, when I was told I had congestive heart failure, I only see end stages and I take them to the ER and then die. Um, or um, they're frequent flyers. So when I had that diagnosis, I was like, oh my God, I'm gonna be that patient. So I did everything under the sun, anything you can think of and everything you could research and my best friend was Google and um, that's not very helpful. Um, <laughs> And I knew that, but I didn't anyway. Um, so I basically, I advocated for myself, which I thought was pretty you know, important for me. I asked questions. Um, Sometimes I, I asked the same question you know, 30 different ways because I wanted a different answer. Um, and, I, and I needed those answers because I needed to know what was going on with me, why this was happening, how come this is happening. Is there anything I could do to prevent it? What can I do to prevent it? How do we do it naturally? How do I not go on these medications? And <clears throat> if I could have reversed it on my own, I would have, and I would have done everything I could, and I did everything I could, um, from dieting to exercising to um, even more mental health. Um, then, you know, I, I fell in love with my support team. Um, being that I was not treated properly in the beginning, it was a little hard for me to trust the doctors and nurses that touched me and treated me, and that's why I was a little more advocating for myself because I was like, well, what are you doing and why? Why are you sticking me? What test do you need to do and was it showing? Um, so I think that it's important as a patient to explain, even if you're talking to like an eight-year-old um, or a five-year-old, why you're doing what you're doing. Some patients will just do it because they don't know any better or they don't know what to ask, but they need to know why um, and what the importance are because sometimes they may just say no, but if you maybe explain to them why they need to do something, they'll, more, they'll be less reluctant to do so. Um, so thanks to my support team, I'm here, I'm alive. Um, I met Mickey in the ER and then, yeah, she would text me every day and I was the patient that did not answer my phone when she called because um, the phone call I knew I did an oops um, or I had some tacos or Chinese food um, <laughs> um, but also when I first got diagnosed a lot of doctors a lot of nurses were treating me um, they weren't treating my symptoms they saw me as a 36 year old female who was active who had a runny nose and a cough and some difficulty breathing um, and with a rapid heart rate. So me, I knew there was something wrong based on my generic vitals because not uh, everybody has a rapid heart rate. Fast forward to the day I met Mickey when we got my, my diagnosis of heart failure. Um, it was traumatizing. 
my whole world turned upside down in five hours. I thought I was dying. I was. Um, so what I learned to do is I learned to trust. Trust the process. Trust my team. Um, everything with Mickey was a negotiation. <laughs> do this, why? And it wasn't just because you need to do it and because I said so. Is she literally sat down and gave me a breakdown um, of everything of why I need to do it, what was going to do, how it was going to affect me. And I said, will it work? And she said, trust me. And because we had that relationship, I did. And then when my MEMS was put in, um, I felt better. And I hated that pillow. I still hate that pillow. Um, <laughs> Because I, you have to wiggle to find it. Like you'll, you, got, you have to wiggle to find your sweet spot. So once you find your sweet spot, you just lay there and you're like, okay. And then it's got this boring elevator music. <laughs> 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 so, <laughs> so you get your, your mems, and then you know I knew within like at least an hour to two hours if I got a phone call, it wasn't good. Like it was high. But if I didn't hear from her, I knew you know I'm okay. Um, so my quality of life before all of these devices was, was very stable but unstable. I knew I was doing well when I wasn't fluid overloaded. I knew that something was wrong when I started to get fluid overloaded. Um, you know, being you know, an EMT and doing 911 emergency services when I wasn't able to get in an ambulance anymore and it took me five minutes to get to my ambulance and I had to go save a life and I couldn't even breathe, I knew that there was you know, something I needed to do. So <clears throat> I really strongly say that you really need to look at all the symptoms, not just the patient, because you might, you know, realize that every patient is different. And for me, you know, if, if Mickey would have treated the patient and not the symptoms, I probably wouldn't be standing here today. Um, she looked past, you know, the out, the out of me, and she looked at, you know, all of my numbers and my blood work and my echoes and my casts and all the tests that I can't remember I took. Um, so now that I have the HeartMate 3, I am back to work. I am living my new normal, which is something it's very hard to understand. And it's not that it's hard physically, it's hard mentally. So when your patients trust you, they trust you. I trust you. Everything was a negotiation. <laughs> but it was worth it. So that being said, I'll end my spiel. Um, just make sure that you trust your patients and their patients trust you because I feel like the more you trust your patients and the more you, the more the patient trusts you, the, the further you can help them. And building a really good relationship with them is important because if I didn't have the relationship I had with Mickey, I probably wouldn't be here today. So thank you.